I'm Jackie Halstead. I direct the Institute for Christian Spirituality and teach Bible here. I have the honor of getting to present to you Dr. Gordon Smith. He's the president of Ambrose College and University and Seminary in Calgary, Alberta. So he's a fellow Canadian. Go Canada. And um, he is more important even than that, which is pretty important. He is a man of God. And I've had the privilege of sitting at his feet a number of times and just um, have been inspired and challenged to keep my focus on Jesus in issues of leadership, in my regular walk of life, in all settings, in all compartments of who I am and what I do. So I'm thrilled. We brought him in for a conference, the Nurture Conference, which is going on right now, which is a conference on spiritual formation. And we brought him in today um, to be able to speak to you for a few minutes. So he has his own college students back in Calgary, so he sees you in a similar vein. So welcome, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Let me say a quick prayer over him, and then he'll talk to you. God, I do thank you for your servant, Gordon. I praise you for the ways you're using him in the lives of so many, especially at Ambrose. Um, continue to bless him and guide him. Give him wi wisdom in the role you have set for him. And I just ask that you be with him today as he speaks, and be with us as we listen for your voice and your word and what he says. I ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. There is an ancient greeting that is appropriate for times such as this. I trust you know what it is. The Lord be with you. That was weak. Let's try it again. The Lord be with you. We could even do a little better than that. Let's try it because you've got to bless the preacher. The Lord be with you. May God truly grace us and bless us as we gather for the fellowship of the Word. Sisters and brothers, men and women, a holy person is a wise person. This is not the only way to speak about the holiness of God and the transforming purposes of God in our lives, and yet there is a profound link throughout the Scriptures between wisdom and righteousness, so much so that we can truly say that a person who is mature in Christ is a wise person. One of the most read texts in Holy Scripture is a text that is found in the opening verses of the letter of Solomon, not the letter, but the writings of Solomon, known as the book of Proverbs. Hear this concise, cogent, and compelling description of the way of wisdom. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for learning about wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for gaining instruction in wise dealing, righteousness, justice, and equity, to teach shrewdness to the simple, knowledge and prudence to the young. Let the wise also hear and gain in learning, and the discerning acquire skill, to understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. While there is much in this text that merits our attention, for our purposes here, I want to make three observations. Firstly, this. Note the close link between wisdom and teaching or instruction. The focus of this instruction, and something integral to wisdom, is the capacity for understanding and insight. The impression is easily left that a wise person is a learned person. Note the line, the wise hear and gain in learning. Knowledge and prudence are intimately linked. Indeed, the whole book of Proverbs is essentially a teaching document, the words of a wise sage, an older person, instructing, teaching a younger person. Wisdom is something, then, that is passed on from one generation to another, and it's specifically passed on from one generation to another through teaching, so that later in the New Testament, Paul says to Timothy, teach those who are capable of teaching others. But what strikes me here is the following, that there is no wisdom without knowledge, and there's no knowledge without teaching. Hear it again. 
There's no wisdom without knowledge, and there's no knowledge without teaching. The reverse to that sequence is not necessarily true. You can have teaching that does not lead to knowledge. We've all had teachers where we didn't learn anything, not here, of course. And we all know people who have a lot of knowledge but do not have wisdom. So the reverse of the sequence is not true. But the sequence as I gave it is biblical witness. There is no wisdom without knowledge and there's no knowledge without instruction and teaching. Second, what is the sign or evidence of this wisdom? In the end, it is not such knowledge. It is rather prudence or character. And in this regard, a number of things come to mind. The first is evident. It's captured by the triptych right at the middle of this, of this pericope. Righteousness, justice, and equity. What is highlighted here right from the very beginning is the link between wisdom and justice. Equity is linked with righteousness. There is no righteousness without justice, and there is no justice without economic justice. Furthermore, the book of Proverbs stresses throughout something evident in all the wisdom literature of the scriptures, that wisdom is evident in what we might call a moral intelligence. If we walk through the book of, Hebrew, book of, of Proverbs and ask the question, what does it mean to have moral integrity and character? Well, the wisdom literature of the Old Testament and the New, thinking Proverbs, of course, but also the book of James, the teachings of Jesus, notably in the Sermon on the Mount, the writings of Paul, there are three distinctive character marks of a mature person. These three come up again and again and again. It's evident in your finances, in your sexuality, and in your speech. Consider just one example. For example, the magnificent call of Ephesians 4 and 5. Here the readers are called to the renewal of their minds, Ephesians 4.23. As those who have learned Christ, what a wonderful way to describe our transformation. We've learned Christ. And then he goes on and highlights what it looks like. What is the evidence that this has taken? Ephesians 4.25, they've put off falsehood and learned to speak the truth. They've turned from evil talk, including slander, and turned towards speech that builds up. Secondly, they devoted themselves to honest work and they are generous towards the needy. And thirdly, They've turned from fornication and impurity to thanksgiving. This is just a core sample, but you'll find these three emerging again and again in what might be called the indicators of moral intelligence, or putting a positive framework to it, a person of wisdom, of moral intelligence, is marked by a constrained sexuality, constrained by the limits of the good, the noble, and the excellent, such that sexuality finds expression within a covenant relationship, that is marriage, in similar fashion, a person of wisdom or moral intelligence is marked by simplicity of speech, what James speaks of as the management or the taming of the tongue, few words aptly spoken. And then we also need to speak about finances. When it comes to moral intelligence in the evidence or the mark of wisdom, few things are so crucial as the way that we live economically. There is no wisdom without financial and economic integrity the careful management of the resources that have been given to us, and generosity and indeed a profound commitment to justice and the economic well-being of all. Speech, sexuality, and finances. And each of these finds expression in community. A person who is wise is a responsible citizen, living and working in deep respect for others in one's community, in one's world, a respect evident in sexual integrity simplicity and truthfulness of speech, and generosity and justice in all matters financial. And then notice this also in Proverbs chapter 1, a slight but not incidental reference to skill. Wise women and men are masters of their craft. They are good at what they are called to do. A wise teacher is a master of instruction. A wise carpenter is good with work, woodworking. A wise doctor or chef or plumber, or writer. Each is skilled in her or his vocation. To put it bluntly, wise people are good at what they do. They master their craft. And each of these, including the third, each of these is a sign of character, a commitment to justice and equity, a commitment to integrity in speech, finances, and sexuality, and a commitment to quality, to skill in the work to which we are called. And then third, 
here in Proverbs chapter 1, but must not be missed. Mentioned here in verse 7, but my sisters and brothers, it is an abiding theme of wisdom throughout the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. Indeed, a recurring theme is the close link between wisdom and the fear of the Lord. This is a defining intellectual capacity and commitment as the beginning and the conclusion of the way of wisdom. The language of fear suggests not to us terror, but humility, a realization that God is God and that all of our learning and all of our wisdom must be understood in the light of the God who is the creator and the source of all wisdom. Thinking of this from a Trinitarian perspective, this broader vision suggests to us that all wisdom comes from God, for God is the source of life, the source of salvation, the source of wisdom. And thus, the book of Proverbs speaks of the fear of God as the beginning of wisdom. But further, Christ Jesus becomes for each of us the embodiment of the wisdom of God, the embodiment of the Word of God. In Jesus, we see the living, breathing vitality that is the wisdom of God lived out in the flesh, and surely part of what draws us to Jesus is a doxological delight in him who is wise. And he is the teacher of those who are teaching others and leading disciples, leading you and me in the capacity to grow into this very wisdom that he embodied. Thus, we seek what we might call a Christological wisdom, realizing that Jesus Christ is the beginning and the end, the alpha and omega of the wisdom for which we long. And yet, not to be missed, is that the fact that Jesus becomes to us the wisdom of God is a reminder that we seek not knowledge in itself, but a personal knowledge, a knowledge that comes from personal engagement with Christ Jesus. And nowhere is this stressed more, more strongly than in the, in the Gospel of John, where Jesus is our teacher, but also is the one who is the giver of wisdom and life. And then also we need to speak of the relationship between the Spirit and wisdom. In anticipation of the ascension, Jesus, in John chapter 16, indicates to his disciples that he has so much more to teach them, but it is, and it's an, it's an exquisite little phrase, but it's more than you can bear, he says to them. But then he says, the good news is that the Spirit is coming, and the Spirit will lead you into all understanding. In other words, the ministry of the Spirit reflects the outgoing, or the outworking, pardon me, of the teaching ministry of Jesus. And in Ephesians and in Colossians and indeed throughout the scriptures, there's a direct link between wisdom and the teaching of the church, where foolishness is contrasted with wisdom and being filled with the Spirit. When we come to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, notice the intriguing counterpoint between the fear of the Lord and teaching and instruction. Oftentimes, people will kind of give you the impression that somehow, if I have God, if I have Jesus, if I'm led by the Spirit, I do not need teaching and instruction. To the contrary, what this suggests, Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord, counterpoint, teaching and instruction, is that there's no inherent tension between receiving wisdom as a gift from God in Christ and by the Spirit and teaching that is vital spiritual practice in the church. The two are mutually dependent. And yet... The main point that is my third point this morning is that we affirm that God is the source of all truth and wisdom, that the fear of the Lord is therefore the beginning of wisdom, and that understanding fear is deference, submission, and humility before God. To understand this is essential if we're going to grow in wisdom. And thus, just as worship and prayer are the means by which we sustain union with Christ, even so the call to teaching and learning is oriented towards obedience and wisdom, and thus towards transformation. The fear of the Lord, just two side points here before I conclude. The fear of the Lord language also speaks about humility. I'm taken by the wonderful line in the ancient liturgy of St. Chrysostom, where before the reading of scripture, the holy book is lifted high and the one presiding calls out, wisdom, be attentive, and then reads the holy text. This call, which in today's liturgies is typically found in Eastern Orthodox services of worship, is a twofold call to humility and to joy. Humility, 
is an essential reference point because knowledge in itself so easily puffs up and so easily leads to dogmatism. True wisdom is evident in humility, a gracious humility that acknowledges our human limitations, the limitations of our knowledge, the limitations of our vantage point. We do not see, we do not have all the truth. And the limits of our knowledge and the limits of our perspective on truth are a reminder to all of us that we are always open to learning, always open to correction, always open to new understanding. And thus, as David Ford, the very fine writer on this topic from Cambridge University, puts it so eloquently, true wisdom is marked by humility and charity towards all, most notably to those with whom we differ. The answer to anti-intellectualism is not dogmatism. We can have a conviction regarding our beliefs, our knowledge, and our understanding. As long as these beliefs, these convictions, are matched by generosity towards others, especially those with whom we differ, and the capacity for a continuous learning. And regarding joy, we do well to remember the wise words of the book of Ecclesiastes that remind us that the pursuit of wisdom is in itself not meant to be burdensome, but I think there's no better way to put this. It's fun. We may well be diligent in our study and in our learning. We may well need to learn how to think hard and deeply and thoroughly, but never let this weigh us down so that we lose our sense of humor or forget what it means to be present in the moment or see the irony of the situations we are in. And thus the words of wisdom suggest that we must always remember to enjoy the gifts of God, of eating, of drinking, and of good work. I love these words from the book of Ecclesiastes. There's nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their toil. This also I saw, he writes to us, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat and who can have enjoyment? For the one who pleases him, God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy. Wise women and men know that the creation is infused with the glory and goodness of God and that we are called to revel in this beauty, this goodness that is revealed to, through all that God has made. And thus we delight in good food and good drink, in the joys of marriage and friendship, in good books, in poetry, in music, and for myself at this stage of my life, in the sheer joy of being a grandfather, unapologetically so. We celebrate the gifts of God for today, and this true is wisdom, for we seek it in the fear of the Lord. Dear sisters and brothers, women and men, I'm reminded of the words of Proverbs chapter four as I read Proverbs chapter one. In Proverbs four, we have a call and an invitation that is captured by this phrase, wisdom, seek her with all of your heart. And I say to you this morning, could it be said that nothing matters more? Life is too short to think, you know, I want to be a wise person, but there's plenty of time for that. I commend to you the following working principle, that when you are old, you will either be an old fool or you will be a wise sage. Sage, You will either be an old fool or a wise sage. And if you are an old fool, it's because you did not make the decisions along the way to pursue the way of wisdom, to get understanding. Though it cost you everything you have, Proverbs, chapter four, Proverbs 4, seek it, get wisdom and cherish her. And if you are wise, it's because all along the way you chose to pursue the way of wisdom. Every class you take here at the university, every topic, every theme, from biology to theology, from education to music, from psychology to business, whatever your focus, seek knowledge, seek understanding, but seek it as a way of pursuing wisdom. Allow your professors to be your mentors, guides in the way of wisdom and thus in the way of life. View each class, not as something to which you are entitled, but as a gift that God has given to you and an opportunity and thus an opportunity to be a steward, as these years, they will pass by so quickly. May they be years in which you grow in wisdom and in the capacity for wisdom. Despise minimalism, doing the least you can do to get by. And then second, as you study, 
and learn and pursue the way of understanding and knowledge. Grow in your capacity for prudence, that is, to seek justice and the way of justice and to love it like you love God, to grow in moral intelligence, integrity in speech, sexuality, and finances, to grow in skill, to be a master of the craft to which God is calling you, so that whatever you do, do it well, with, a zero, with zero patience for mediocrity. And in all of this, to delight in Christ, the source of wisdom, the embodiment of wisdom, the one who loves you, calls you, and empowers you to live wisely, indeed to live the life to which you have been called. Amen.